As we come to this time, I want to again thank um, all of the special music and musicians for this day. Thank you very much for your gift of music in song uh, and in brass. Um, also, I want to say that for those of you who are home today or not in the room with us, particularly I'm thinking of Lola Edwards, our oldest member who joins us every single week on, uh, on live stream. Lola, we are missing you here today and uh, we're sending you our love. And Twink at 100, Lola's right behind you, you know that, at 99 and a half. She's trying to catch up. It's February, she'll join you, and she will. Um, so the two of you bless us mightily. And everyone who is listed here is a true blessing to this church and has been for so long. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We just heard Jesus tell a parable. He told the parable about a rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus is the only person named by Jesus in any one of his parables. He has no other names. They're all characters in the stories, but this one has a name. He tells this story about Lazarus and the rich man to shake up his audience. And my friends, we are the audience today. Luke recounts this parable with shrewd social geography. The rich man, enmeshed in his wine and purple finery, dwells on the secure side of the door and in his mansion and practices routines that insulate him from noticing anyone on the outside. Lazarus is on the outside. Lazarus, whose name means God will help us, God will help us, lives on the other side of the door in the squalor outside the mansion. Surrounded by dogs and described as if his wounds of his body were his attire, that is gross, Lazarus appeared as the stark opposite of the inner circle's lavish luxury. When the two of them die and everyone dies, the story turns upside down. Angels fly to carry Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man dies and is buried. I love how that's written because the sentence ends there. He's buried, boom, he's in the ground, he's gone. And then where he ends up is in Hades, the obscure habitation named for the Greek god of two things, the underworld and wealth. What a distinction. Death exalts Lazarus and disrobes the rich man of everything that has given him all his identity. From his place among the nameless dead, and notice that they're all nameless, and everybody else in the story on high has a name. The once wealthy man sees Lazarus glorying in the arms of Abraham, and in life, even though he had literally to step over Lazarus every day on his way into his mansion, the rich man never even noticed him. Now in eternity, as Lazarus has become untouchable, the rich man finally sees him and even uses his name. It's like it's come to him after the fact. But undoing that tiny step toward the esteeming of the existence of another, he reveals that he remains completely self-absorbed. Father Abraham, he says, see how I suffer. Order that beggar to help me, he says. That's not going to happen. It ain't happening, to put it in the vernacular. When Abraham explains that it's impossible, the man continues exposing the minuscule size of his circle of concern. Now that he has discovered eternal truth, He's carried only about the kids inside his house, his five siblings. Abraham explains the tragic truth that if people remain deaf to the words of Moses and all of the prophets, not even someone who rises from the dead 
can displace them from being the center of their carefully cultivated and very tiny universe. As we have seen, Luke's gospel becomes more pointed as Jesus travels closer to the culmination of his journey and his ministry in Jerusalem. And his emphasis on serving the poor continues to grow along with his call to the cost of discipleship for everyone. So as this moves, I think of somebody who comes before us in history, Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens, as you probably know, left school at the age of 12 because he couldn't afford to stay in school. His father was put in debtor's prison and he was put out of the classroom. This, he illustrated Jesus' values for the 19th century with a more hopeful version of this parable in his classic, A Christmas Carol. We all know the story. Dickens introduces us to Scrooge, a miser who believes the poor people are the unnecessary bother, the unworthy, those who we should not consider, and as we all know, there's poor houses for them. That's where they're destined to go. They might as well get there and die sooner. I think those are direct quote, isn't it? <laughs> At least a paraphrase. Happily, three ghosts visit Scrooge through a review of his past, offering him a last-ditch opportunity to create a different future in which he puts his mammon, his wealth, to good use. Now, each Christmas, we somehow revisit this story. I don't know about you, but it doesn't matter what version I see it in, I always end up crying when Scrooge turns around. The whole world cheers as Scrooge is converted Christmas by Christmas, as he comes together with his family that he had literally just disparaged minutes ago, or if you're reading the book, just a few pages back. Unfortunately, we can't count on ghosts to appear when people like us become blinded by the things of our lives, right? Let's just say the gospel is our ghost, leading us to see whatever we need to do to see whoever we need to see outside our doors and all the way around the world. Let's remember, the wealthy man in Jesus' story was never blamed for Lazarus' poverty. That's a very important thing to hold on to. He's not blamed for Lazarus' cause, right? Similarly, few of us have been consciously added to the list of those who caused impoverishment or those who are unhoused outside our doors. They, uh, folks don't look at us and say, you did this to them, or the migrants or refugees that number, whose number keeps growing around the world. None of us, I don't think, have promoted or profited from Russia's attack and that savage war against Ukraine. But Jesus' parable has nothing to do with causes. It has to do with effects. He is talking about people who fail to respond to the suffering and to the needs of others. When Jesus gives Lazarus a name, he acknowledges his unique personal dignity and worth. Naming Lazarus serves as a prelude to describing how Abraham lavishing him with respectful tenderness will play itself out while the wealthy man remains anonymous allowing himself to be defined by position and possessions rather than relationships. Unlike the crafty steward servant that we met last, in last week's parable, the rich man fails to discover the potential of his wealth, which was there all along. Instead, he watches his wealth become worthless in the face of death. Now, we've been hearing this recently because it's true, and that's Jesus is a partier. You know that, he, he loves to go to parties. He never critiques festivity. So in this celebration that's going on with Abraham and Lazarus, he's all in. He also never fails to interact with people in their suffering. And why is this? I've always wondered why Jesus had this gift, why it was that there was something within him that could speak from the heart of his experience. Perhaps it came from his birth. Perhaps because he was born outside of a house in December, in a barn in Bethlehem, maybe he had some unusual connection to the pain and suffering of other people. Perhaps it was because he was a refugee within hours of his birth, within days of his birth, as his family 
tried to escape and made it to Egypt, and he was raised with, with a culture not his own and a people not his own. Perhaps it was when he returned to his land and discovered that in the aftermath of his leaving, every Jewish boy in the house of David that was his age was killed. And he grew up as the only Jewish boy of that generation. Do you think he didn't know that? Perhaps it was because his father died when he was young and he was given care of his entire household, his mother, his brothers, his sisters. Perhaps all of those things shaped him, all of those circumstances and more that we don't even know heightened his sensitivity to outsiders, to refugees, to those who were migrants, to those who were left alone, those who carried all the loads of life, those who forged his awareness of what it literally meant to be an outsider. He could speak to shepherds and beggars because he'd been outside with them. He knew what that was like. But he also made sure that every one of them got invited to his party. <laughs> he had this way of bringing them back in joyfully, right? He didn't just like say, hey, Lazarus. He would say, hey, Lazarus, come over to my place. Or usually, since he didn't really have a place, it would be somebody else's place. Like, let's come over to Tom's. You're going to have a party there. But he always had this way of drawing people in. If you've ever felt like an outsider in your life, Maybe that's where you feel this special connection to Jesus, and I know he feels it to you. If you've ever felt like you were cast out and left alone, if you've ever felt that somebody had just run your name down into the mud, or maybe you'd lost your stature or your place, then you know how he relates to you. If any of you have felt like an outsider, you know exactly what he's going through. But Jesus never hawked tickets for guilt trips about this. He was always about trying to entice people, to draw people into an awareness, to stretch outside themselves, to reach outside to others, to have adventures beyond themselves, to make the journey of life special. And it is in this process of inclusion that Jesus in invites all of us to engage. You see, it is one thing to care about the poor, and even donate for the poor. But to go the step farther is the thing he calls us to. Prayers and donations don't call us out. They just help us stay inside to help those outside. Our time is much too limited on this earth, and our resources are much too limited too, to just simply give that way. We're actually called to greet the other, to know the migrant, to engage the beggar, to, in, to know by name and life experience the ones that are just outside our gates, right? We have to begin by making a choice to include others and then learn each other's names in the steps of the journey headed toward enjoying a future in the bosom of Abraham. See, we are a people whose origin story begins as outsiders. In 1852, 27 women and 15 men could no longer be inside a Christian church that said it's okay to have slaves, it's okay to abuse people, it's okay to use people for your profit. They couldn't do that any longer. They couldn't handle it. They couldn't go to church that way. So they set out and they started something different and they were active in the Underground Railroad movement. They set forth a new congregation dedicated to include others. And we have to believe that Lazarus was there on their first day cheering them on from the arms of Abraham with Jesus right by his side, watching them head down Third Street to a new location saying, hey, those guys are on the right path. I want to see more people join them and forever work for the abolishment of slavery. You know what? Those 42 forebearers in faith gave us a DNA that we can't shake. It's in us. By their example, they helped change the landscape of Columbus and eventually the nation and the world. They showed us a better way. They showed us how to live into the fullness of liberating faith and placed us on their shoulders in the battle against racial injustice. So how have we done? How have we done for the past 170 years? 
How have we lived into the fullness of their initial challenge and call to justice? Have we, uh, following those starters of the, on the outside, become insiders, or have we maintained our strong presence outside the gates? Have we stood with Lazarus, who we know by name, or have we joined the forces of the nameless rich who've forgotten where they came from? Have, which ones are we? Well, I think it's a mixed bag, right? I think we have a mixed story. Some days were better than others. Some weeks were better than others. Some years were better than others. But we always are wrapped in the grace of God, called to be even clearer in our walk with Jesus. Our plumb line is still there. We know it's recognizable. And I don't think we can be members and friends of First Church unless we do justice, unless we love mercy, and unless we walk humbly with God as the prophet invokes. Years ago, theologian Robert McAfee Brown offered a very clear vision on how to stand up, how to speak out, how to do justice. He said, stand up and speak out on behalf of the poor and those who need your voice in this world. Remember three things when you do. Number one, where you stand will determine what you will see. Where you stand will determine what you will see. Whom you stand with will determine what you will hear. Whom you stand with will determine what you will hear. And what you see and what you hear will determine what you say and how you will act. Those are important things, so let's hear them again. Who you stand, where you stand will determine what you see. Whom you stand with will determine what you hear. What you see and what you hear will determine what you say and how you act. Those are pretty simple guides. Those three guides for standing, seeing, hearing, and acting can be applied to everything in life. They really can, all situations, and I've tried to use them over the years for myself. I encourage you to use them as well. We encounter this every day. We have folks all around us who are standing with certain folks, they have no idea what they're looking at or seeing because we're supposedly looking at the same thing, but it's not always the case, right? So we all have a perspective, right? Or we find ourselves standing and hearing things that we've only heard about a second hand, perhaps. But we need to dig deeper. We need to bother to ask some more questions. Then we can make up our minds based on all of this. As somebody said to me recently, Reverend Tim, don't mess me up with the facts. I already have my ma mind made up. So I've heard that before. In fact, I think I've said that before. So through the ages, we have seen that people make determinations and make choices to stand in certain places. And we've all done it. There's goodness in it, there's strength in it, but times are tough right now. I mean, well, how do we do that? How do we make those choices? That's a really important question. Maybe we turn back to the plumb line himself, Jesus the includer, and watch what he does in situations like we're facing in the world in which we live. He calls us to move outside of ourselves and to get to know the names of those who we haven't known before, whose names have not even resonated for us. He calls us then to be led to be in harmony and community. He calls us to find unity in our shared vision. And while like the rich man, we all want to get into heaven, we will discover that Jesus wants even more for heaven to get into us. And when that happens, we will find ourselves in the bosom of Abraham, right next to Lazarus, right beside Jesus, and right alongside all of the includers that we've known through the ages, but especially today, alongside the 42, the includers who got us here in the first place.